Taxpayers Act and the impact on uh, RMD planning. So RMDs are required minimum distributions. I don't like using a lot of acronyms, but that is pretty much, uh, that, that's pretty well what everyone uh, calls them as RMDs. So we're gonna talk about a couple things here. So there's a lot of uh, changes that have happened here. There's the, uh, the SECURE Act, the CARES Act, there's IRS um, notices, and that leads to some planning choices. And feel free to ask questions. I, I think so isn't, isn't this the dream? You look here that you know, when you retire, you just want some time together and nothing to worry about. Uh, I know this picture really probably is not uh, accurate for the way things are today because I don't think that couple is six feet apart. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, the idea is to make sure we structure things so that you have your opportunity to deal with your dream, whatever it might be. And, uh, and we have to look at different ways to help you get there. And some of your dreams may be to help yourself out financially. Some may be non-financial things. We have to make sure we incorporate all that together when we determine anyone's plan. So let's look at how some of the, the recent changes may change how you're getting to your dream. So way back when, when I started at uh, John Knudsen and Company, or JAK, the rule of thumb was there was a major tax bill about every other year. Oh, there'd be some minor ones, but there's only a major bill about every other year. And then the pace started picking up, then maybe it seems like there's a major bill every year. Now, um, the, the pace of change, has been far beyond what I have ever experienced and I don't think has ever occurred in the history of our tax system. The, uh, the pace of change is just uh, very, very fast. So one of the first things that, that happened uh, way back when at the end of De December uh, 2019, you know, I know it seems like forever ago, but it's less than a year ago, the SECURE Act was, Passed. And in the SECURE Act, one of the things we'll bring up is that it did change the required minimum distribution age from the 70 and a half that we'd grown up for years and years with to 72. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. One is if you are already required to take RMDs for 2019, the change in age does not impact you. So if you were 70 and a half, um, that doesn't mean you no longer have to do that uh, RMDs uh, in 2020 based upon the SECURE Act. Um, it also changed some beneficiary planning uh, because now IRAs have to be distributed within uh, 10 years after the year of death, be they Roth IRAs, be they, uh, be they regular IRAs. Oh, there's a few exceptions, but by and large, most IRAs have to be distributed within 10 years of death. So it was, so uh, back then we were talking about how you lay out your beneficiary designations. It may change how you want to do beneficiary designations because the old rule of thumb was you would have the younger generation, the beneficiary of your Roth IRAs because those could be distributed out over a longer period of time. And therefore by the younger generation having those, you are earning tax-free income over a longer period of time. And then the more senior generation you would probably have as beneficiaries of your regular IRAs. That might, your planning in this area might be flipped. So we thought we'd take this op opportunity to bring this up that uh, your senior generation may want to be a beneficiary of the Roth accounts 
because the senior generation may be in a higher tax bracket than the younger generation. And if they are, and if the money has to come out at the same point, might be better to have lower taxes for the senior generation, a little higher taxes for the people in the lower brackets. So what's best for you? Like most of the, uh, the, wor the tax world, it depends. But it is an opportunity to relook at your beneficiary designations and uh, watch what they're, and watch what's being done. Because remember, your will could say, I give my IRA account to, to Todd Koch. It, you, your will could say that. But you know how much impact that has? None because your, benef your IRAs are gonna follow beneficiary designations. So, they're gonna, so you're gonna see how, however they are filled out is how things are gonna be done. So at this time, it might be a good time to evaluate your overall beneficiary designation plan program. It's a very often uh, forgotten uh, thing to do as part of your overall estate and cash flow planning and if you're uh if you're like mo a lot of people uh your retirement plan is maybe your largest financial asset so you want to make sure your largest financial asset is going where you want when you want to whom you want so after that we thought okay we got we got that kind of figured out we got the SECURE Act passed, uh, the uh, RMD planning went in there, thought, okay, now we can move on with the rest of the tax season. We got everything all figured out. Well, then, well, the, uh, the world kind of changed here, didn't it? Here uh, around uh, St. Patrick's Day, it started shutting, shutting the things down due to uh, all the virus and, and just trying to figure out where we are, how things are going and where they're going. So in the uh, CARES Act, which was passed in March, there were a lot of provisions within the act. Uh, for those of you who listen to me speak most a lot this year, by far and away, most of the presentations have been on uh, PPP, Paycheck Protection Program Loans. Uh, and for those of you that thought you were gonna hear, hear uh, another one of those today, well, not today, but I'm fully believing there'll be another one uh, shortly. So, uh, but we thought we'd take the time today to talk about another provision here that's got some timeliness in it. So the uh, CARES Act had another RMD change. So with the, the change in the market, remember we're talking in March and in March the market had just, had taken a big nosedive, hadn't it? And with this big nosedive, now the uh, value of people's accounts had really fallen. And to, as you know, you don't really wanna take, sell stocks when the value is down. Why, why sell when the, in essence, quote unquote, stocks are on sale. So as they had done in the, the past, uh, back in uh, 2009, they, uh, Congress said, hey, you're not required to take out RMDs for 2020. Well, that's great, but you know what? You may have already taken that money out. But Congress said you didn't have to. So then, now um, the IRS is trying to figure out how to get to those congressional intents. So if, they, if Congress really meant that you didn't have to take out a distribution for 2020, and maybe you did, what do you do? So they had the first, uh, the first go around was when they extended the time for tax filing, they meaning the IRS, when they extended the time for tax filing to July 15th. Every, uh, everyone was well aware of that one. In there though, 
there was a lot of other things that got pushed off till July 15th. So one of the things in there actually affected RMDs. And one of the things you can do with a, uh, when you take money out of your IRA, there's the 60 day rollover period in there. So the same, what, when they wrote up the rules for, they mean the IRS, when they wrote the rules for delaying actions that had to be done by July 15th, by April 15th and push him out to July 15th. One of the things they rolled over was the ability to do these rollovers within 60 days. So any rollover that had to be done by April 1st was pushed off till July 15th. Well, that meant that if you took a required minimum distribution out in February or March, or April, you could push that off. You could roll dollars back into your account by July 15th. It was a nice stopgap, but there's a couple things that there was a problem with. This stopgap. One is, remember I said February, March, or April. What about if you took your money out in January? Well, but with the stop gap, people who took their our required minimum distribution out in January could not roll it back where anybody else could. So um, that was one hole. And I will tell you a lot when we're talking to a, people, the most common time, there's three ways we usually see required minimum distributions done. One is to take it out at the beginning of the year and then spending the money down all year. And so it'd be January. Two, and the more most common one is to take the money out in November or December. Just make sure you get it done by the end of the year. Um, and usually a lot of people do that. They take the money out and then they'll spend it over the next year. The third way is some people take out money every month. Just kind of like a, a, an essence of a pension. Well, with rollovers, you're only allowed to do one. Well, if you have all these rollovers, meaning you took out monthly amounts, how can I, I can, means I can only choose one of those amounts? Well, wait a minute. Every one of those were part of my required minimum distribution. Why can't I roll them all back? So the IRS then came out with this notice 202051. And 202051 says required minimum distributions can be rolled back into your IRA by August 31st, 2020. And that's the reason we're talking today. So there is another deadline, August 31st, 2020. So if you had took out any required minimum distributions at any time during 2020, from your IRAs, you can put that money back into your account. And then you will not be taxed on those funds in your account. Sounds really, so you don't have to, it's a choice. So when you have this choice, um, you can decide what you wanna do, right? So let's, uh, which is a nice way to look at it, that, it's whatever it is for you. So if you, I have been living on these dollars and you say, oh, I don't want to put them back. You don't have to. So um, you get to, and the uh, IRS also got rid of, they said, if you took out money every month, we'll let you take all those dollars call and, and we'll eliminate the one rollover uh, a year for an account. The one rollover rule will, will waive that rule. We will, uh, in essence, allow you to do a series of rollovers. Just make sure you get the dollars back into your account by August 31st. Now, we keep talking dollars. One of the nuances is it has to be what you took out. So most people take out dollars. Um, if you had, if you took out specific stocks or if you took out property or something from your IRAs, you got to put that back in. 
not, not the value of it. So whatever you took out, you put back in. So IRS went back and did that. Now, just so you know, if, you, if you're out reading, the, um, if you are a technical person like we are, um, realistically, the IRS didn't have the authority to do these taxpayer-friendly changes uh, because they really went beyond what they typically would do. They're actually changing what some of the statute is and overlooking part of the statute. This is not just a technical issue. But realistically, do you think anyone's going to challenge the IRS for making a taxpayer-friendly change? Um, so it's just uh, some people are a little concerned that IRS is overstepping here. Maybe they might overstep doing a taxpayer-not-friendly change. Um, but the uh, issue is here, we have the ability to go back. You don't have to do all of the RMD, you can do part of it. You, if you're taking out monthly amounts, you can put them back in. Life is much more flexible. And by making this change, they're getting back to what Congress intended, which is you're not required to take out an RMD. You're not required to sell your stocks at a discount. So, question is, should you roll it back? Well, my response to that is, if you do not need the funds, why not roll it back? Remember, if you put the money back, you can always take it out later. If you, uh, but if you need the funds, by all means, keep them, use them. It is part, you know, if that helps you get to your dream, if you, need those dollars to be sitting out on the uh, on the beach and watching the sunset go ahead and do that uh, don't feel you have to it's your dollars it's helping you atta uh, attain your goals so uh, but realistically if you don't need the funds I cannot think of a good reason why you would not put the funds back you know, if you uh, want to watch how things are going, you're not sure, you can roll it back and make sure it's uh, invested in cash, right? Uh, if you are, um, so it'll be accessible at a, a time where it might be better. But there's uh, some other reasons why you may want to do it. Because remember, if you don't have the required minimum distribution by the end of August, if you're annualizing your income, you don't owe a September estimate on that either. So it allows you, even if you were going to take the money out, to defer paying income taxes. And uh, like uh, the old-fashioned rule, the old uh, uh, Ernest and Julio Gallo, uh, they used to talk about why no, many people think of the same thing about taxes. We pay no tax before it's time. So if you want, you can defer those taxes by just pay paying the dollars back. So I, again, the summary, I can't think, if you don't need the money, I can't think of any reason why you would not put the funds back in, into your account. But what should you do? It really is, it, it depends upon a lot of things. And uh, those of you that have worked with me, you can, uh, I love this little whiteboard thing because I have a, uh, a four by eight whiteboard in my office. That's kind of how it looks by the time I'm done with the meeting. Hopefully the, uh, the words are a little clearer than their one, two, three uh, <laughs> with the squiggles. But, um, but it shows that it depends upon a lot of things. So even if you roll back, you're saying, if you don't need the money, why, why don't you roll it back? Because I'm saying you can defer the tax. I'm saying it allows you options to figure out where you want. But then there's other things you may want to think about. Maybe you're going to take out the minimum. Maybe you're going to take out way more. And we'll talk about why you might want to do that. And then the other thing is, okay, if you don't need the dollars, maybe it's the opportunity to do a Roth conversion. We're going to pay tax on some of the dollars 
but not take out the money and let it grow. Instead of tax deferred, you're gonna let it grow tax free. And also is a nice way to uh, gift dollars to your heirs without filing a gift tax return. Because remember, if you're paying the gift, the tax for your heirs, I look at that as a gift because you're using your money to pay something they would normally have to pay. But it's not looked at that way at the tax code. So you can, there's some things you might want to do doing that for that purpose. So like most, most things in the tax world, what you should do, it all depends upon you. You are unique. Your situation is unique. Let's work together to figure out how you should work through the uniqueness of your situation to accomplish your goals, be they financial or non-financial goals. I'm hearing too many people are saying, roll it back and don't take, and, uh, don't take the money out and don't convert because we don't wanna pay any tax today. And I'm saying that that in itself is fraught with dangers. Um, because some of my people, when you look, if they don't have a required minimum distribution, their income may be lower than the standard deduction. Well, if your income is lower than the standard deduction, or maybe you're in a 0% federal tax bracket because uh, you have capital gains and qualified dividends, why would you not use the low brackets? Why wouldn't you maybe uh, look to get things so that you could take some money out and still be at a no additional tax? We won't, don't want to leave those tax dollars to be paid by others where we could pay it at nil um, or maybe very low brackets. The other thing is um, we're doing a lot was using the low brackets. You know, there's a number of brackets in our tax system, but I really look at it as three groups. There's 10 and 12, and I call that 12. There's 22 and 24, I call it 24. And then, that, then it goes up to 37. There's a small bracket in there. So it's really 12, 24, 37, okay? So let, I, we're saying most people, you should use your 10 and 12% brackets because your heirs likely won't be in a 10 or 12% bracket down the road. So let's help everybody out, meaning not only yourself, but also your heirs, by using those low brackets when we have the opportunity to do so. Not every year do we have that opportunity, depending on how, how things go. But for now, make sure you always use your, uh, lose your standard or itemized deductions to offset your income. So if you're not using that, you're giving away a 0% bracket. We don't want to do that. Two, uh, when using the low brackets, I, I always look at the 10 and 12, make sure you're using those every year. Um, because that it's, you know, those are historically low brackets. So let's uh, take advantage of those for you and your heirs. But again, if, uh, if, it's a, if it doesn't meet your goals, then don't do it. But those are some very good rules of thumb that most people are, are using. Yes, I don't do everything by, uh, by chalk anymore. But uh, realistically, is if you're trying to figure out what your incremental tax rate is, that is the, the tax on the next dollar, it is not easy. Uh, some of those geometry proofs that he look, looks like this guy is doing here, um, they sometimes can be easier than trying to figure out the tax on your next dollar. So let's talk about a real, a real world one in uh, use today's brackets, but this really did happen to one of my accounts. Um, so Stan was a, uh, was a client here, um, and Stan wanted to get his tax done really early because frankly, Stan was dying. So he didn't want to, his heirs to have to worry about getting his, uh, his tax return done. He said, said don't worry about it, Stan. Uh, we'll take care of it. We'll get it done. Brought his stuff in. We got it done very promptly. 
Um, Stan was happy and uh, then Stan passed. Well, like many years, um, Stan got an amended 1099. So with his amended 1099, we had to pick up about a, another thousand dollars of income. Now I was working with uh, Stan's brother, who's an attorney, and uh, so uh, we're, and he said, well, Todd, will you prepare the amended return for us? I uh, said, happy to do so. So when I pulled together his amended tax return, Stan would have been the equivalent of the 12% bracket here this year. So if I had to pick up another thousand bucks, um, Warren, who was Stan's brother, Warren was thinking, okay, I can do this math pretty quick. I'm expecting to have a tax bill for about 120 bucks and a little bit of interest. Well, when it was all done, we pulled it together on a thousand dollars of income. When we were done with the returns, there would be an equivalent of about four hundred and forty dollars to plus interest. Now, for some reason, Warren was very upset with me, and he said, "Todd, what do you mean a thousand dollars of income for someone in a twelve percent federal bracket?" should be about $120. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with your software? And some other choice words. So then we talked it through and said, well, here's realistically what happened. Well, he's in a 12% federal bracket. So that's right. I said, okay. But in equivalent times here, he'd be in a 7% state bracket. So Warren, you got to add those together. Okay, all right. But that's only 19%, Todd. You still are, don't know what you're doing. Well, here's the deal. That $1,000 created an additional, um, additional amount of taxable Social Security benefits of another $1,000 due to, to the brackets he was in. So now instead of $1,000, I'm at $2,000. And if now I'm at $2,000, now remember I said Stan was ill, well he had a medical expense deduction. So that $2,000 reduced his um, medical expense deductions. And that um, medical expense deduction be about another 150 bucks, seven and a half percent. So now I went from 12%, but now it's 12 plus seven. Now it's 12 plus seven times in essence, 2.1, you know, 2.15. That when you do that whole math, because a thousand dollars of income created a thousand thousand dollars of additional social social security tax income, plus reduced his itemized deductions. You put that all together, he's looking up about forty to forty three percent, depending upon where you're at. This is one I could explain mathematically because there's a lot of hidden brackets, so it's really simple to read a table it's very difficult to figure out what the overall impacts of you. It's part of what I call the unnecessary complexity of our tax system. This unnecessary complexity adds in all these phases and phase outs. So you've got the regular rate schedule, you got state taxes, you got social security taxes, then you got a couple issues with Medicare tax impact and that, that hit a lot of uh, people take out required minimum distributions. And I say it, two issues, meaning if your income is a lot higher, um, taking out additional income can create the uh, net investment income tax or NIP, that 3.8% tax 
the, even though the, re, the distributions themselves are not subject to this tax, taking out additional money may create additional net taxes on other income that wouldn't have been taxed if you didn't take out this money. And probably the one that gripes people the most when that happens is if your income goes up, then your Medicare premiums can actually change. So if you think of your Medicare premiums that, yes, no one likes paying anything, but if you're at the base Medicare tax premiums, you're paying realistically if you, uh, about a fourth of the cost. And how did I come up with about a fourth of the cost? Is that if, if your incomes go up, if you're um, at Bill Gates type of income, your premiums are four times as much. And there's a phase, phased in step ups. That, uh, there's different steps within the way that get you up to that, that significantly higher taxable income on that. So what you wanna watch for is if you're barely gonna cross another step, that can be a huge tax impact on that one distribution. So what I've done uh, for, for one person is she realized she was going to go just over this step and she thought, well, she should stop there. And I said, no, why don't we go all the way through the step? Stop just before the next one. So that way we can level out that extra cost over that entire bracket of, uh, of income. And that in essence reduced her effective tax rate on that incremental income. Now, she didn't like having to pay the tax, but because uh, I, I call that extra Medicare premium, in essence, another tax. Um, it's a way to say, well, we don't have to like it, but here's another way to deal with it. And that's realistically what a lot of what we're trying to do here is how to deal with the hand we're dealt, the complexities that we're dealt, and how to move things forward. So when you're looking at what you really want to do, you really want to affect, you really want to pull things together. And that's another reason why I think we want people to roll dollars back. It's really not till the end of the year, you know where your taxes, tax bracket really is. So if you roll the dollars back, and um, if you're worried about the, the market risk, the market, you know, as you know, the market went down about 30%, now we're back up 30%. Um, we are, uh, if you're worried about that, if that's an issue, then invest it in cash. Then we can deal with what you want to do with it later. Again, fit where you, where you want in there. Then we can look and see where we are down the road. We can have an idea if you have any unique things that are happening within the year. Are there some other opportunities to take advantage of? Let's understand where we're really at. You know, Congress is still in session now. Uh, they're they're tinkering with the tax code again as part of uh, dealing with the uh, part of its PPP program. Part of it's the uh, unemployment benefits. Part of it is how you want to really uh, help out states for lost revenues. Um, there's a lot of things going on that they want to address. Well, who knows what else they're going to put into it. Uh, anyone that says they know is, uh, it's, it's a, in a political year, it's really tough to figure out what to do. So let's, let's wait, make the decision when it's best for you. Make the decision where we have more information so we can understand what, the rate schedule really is going to be understand what's really going on uh, with the rest of your whole tax situation. You know, too many times people are looking at tax planning. The old-fashioned tax planning was making sure you paid your state taxes in the year incurred. Uh, well, when they changed the uh, itemized deductions, that didn't become as big an issue for 
for people. So many people didn't want us to actually do much planning. And we respected that. But remember, planning is about two things. It's understanding these impacts all the way through. And probably the most important part of planning is making sure you can anticipate the cash flow that is needed. Because even if you don't get a benefit for prepaying for your state taxes, so you're not going to worry about planning, wouldn't you want an idea what you might owe next April so you can plan for that, so you can understand what monies you may or may not need, decide when you want to pay your estimates, where that money's going to come from? It's really important. So let's uh, help reduce burdens in, the, in that way, uh, make your life a little, little, little easier. And speaking of the future uh, tax rates, um, you know, that's realistic that we, what, what are we really doing? We're not planning for where we are today, we're planning for where we're going forward. And one of my adages is tax, you know, tax law is permanent until it changes. Well, we even have change in our code as it is today because the individual rates continue to the end of 2025. And then right now I said they may change because they're written that they will change. But my goodness, how many elections? We have a couple of elections before the end of 2025. So I, who knows what the real brackets might be. And we always, and then, um, and then the, the money that's going out the door federally is, uh, wow, it's, uh, it's amazing what they're funding at this point in time is the, but so at some point, I'm guessing those dollars are gonna have to be paid back. And there might be some federal changes down the road on who's gonna pay things back. Uh, I don't know about you, but I don't see rates going lower. You know, historically, uh, in my lifetime, the, the uh, top tax bracket has been as low as 28%, you know, according to the tables. It's also been as high as 92%, according to the tables. Well, I said, well, Todd, that was way back in the early 60s. You couldn't even remember it back then. And no, I was not practicing back in the early 60s. But if you look just in the time of practice though, rates have been as high as 70%, as low as 28. And when they dropped to 28, it didn't take long for them to go up to 39. So you never know what's gonna be done. So by proper planning, we can take care of the fluctuations. So take care of the lower, the, the lower tax times when they occur and helpfully defer uh, income or accelerate deductions to the times when we may not have as high, when we have higher brackets. So, um, and don't remember the state because unlike the federal government can deficit spend. State of Minnesota can. And there's a lot, the, the, the you know, Sales tax collections are way down. Um, income tax collections are gonna be, they're gonna be, you know, incomes are not where they were. So if we have a reduction in dollars coming into the state, yes, we can cut spending. We'll see, but there's things that they would like to spend on. Um, so it's very, we have to watch for increased tax rates going forward. Not judging is not political. It is just trying to understand the economics of it. And changes in political control also may change our tax policy. And again, this is not political. It's understanding that you have to look at who's making the rules because the rules impact the rates and the rates impact what comes out of your pocketbook. So do we want to look at how things are cha changing or may change? Uh, going forward and then um, especially uh, you know the so that for for federal there's a you know 
right now, uh, you know, the presidential race is going on, um, as well as all of the, uh, the representatives and a chunk of the senators are all up. And things may change. Uh, at the state level, yes, the governor is not going to change. But uh, one of the things to keep in mind is in our split government from the Minnesota perspective, the, the House is controlled by the uh, Democrats right now. And the, the Senate is controlled by the Republicans. Now the Senate, every Minnesota runs their Senate races differently. Every Senate Senator is running this year. Uh, just the way things work. The Republicans control the Senate by one seat, one. So if the Democrats pick up a net one seat in the Senate, it could be that one political party would control everything in the state of Minnesota. So you have to just keep that in mind as you're looking at what the planning. So we see a lot of planning that's going to happen in November and December of 2020, depending upon how the elections go. I hope your person wins, whoever they are. But depending upon where you look at changes in political control, where you look at potent, we'll have a better idea of uh, what we're looking at for a Minnesota deficit later. There's just, um, then we can use those facts to come to a better decision. So in summary, you have a choice to make by the end of August. Um, it's not September 1st, end of August. Whether or not you want to roll over your required minimum distributions. Not everything you took out, just the required minimum distributions. Uh, for most people, if you don't need the money, we're strongly suggesting that you do roll back the amounts by the end of August. Then we can have more flexibility in planning going forward. If those dollars are dollars you you uh, spent and you need and you want to use to accomplish your dreams and goals, please don't feel bad. Just spend the money, um, enjoy your enjoy your time on what's going on. So. Uh, if you have other questions, I'll be answering the, there's a few questions that came in. I'll take care of answering those. Uh, if you have anything else, of course, uh, there's my contact information. So I'm looking here. So, uh, so the first question is, if you took out an RMD in January, put the money in a brokerage account, can you take the money from a checking account to repay it? Or do you have to unwind the brokerage gains and losses? No, you have to put back in what you took out. What you took out was money. So put back in money. Doesn't have to be the exact where those dollars went. It could be different dollars, but it's just whatever you took out. In this case, it was dollars. So we want to put in dollars. If taxes were withheld from the RMB, do you have to get back the gross and not the net? And that is correct. So you do have to put back the gross if you don't want to be taxed on anything. If you put back the net, you will be taxed on the amount you did not roll back. And that becomes a bigger issue for, for some people uh, than that. And then, uh, does it matter if check came to the individual and the monies were invested rather than another pathway to the brokerage deposit? Again, so really, it's getting back to what came out and what came out were dollars. So we just wanna put in dollars and it could be different dollars. And in many cases, there would be different dollars because maybe you spent the money. And so you're gonna to go to your savings account that, uh, uh, and use that in, instead. And that's absolutely fine. There's no, no worries about that. Uh, uh, I had a question on, uh, 
Secure Act, so another provision in there. Uh, the $300 above the line 2020 contribution deduction, is it per return or per taxpayer? Um, Tiger, I'll get back to you. I believe it, it is, uh, I thought it was per return, not per taxpayer, but Tiger, I'll look that up and get back to you. Um, so, um, so the, to be clear about it, uh, this is a good technical question. So if you were 70 and a half in 2019, um, she may, uh, if, if you, uh, the 2020, you are tech under the SECURE Act, you're still required to take a required minimum distribution for 2020. So if you turn 70 and a half in 19, um, you, that 72 rule does not apply to you. But for 2020, you don't have to take out a required minimum distribution in this case because the CARES Act said you don't have to take one out. So follow it through, turn 70 and a half in 2019, you don't have to take out a required minimum distribution in 2020. Uh, but in 2021, without a further change by Congress, you will have to take out a required minimum distribution um, because you can't wait until you're 72. Uh, you, you are subject to the, the rules of 70 and a half in 2019. Uh, it's one of those technical issues. And Wayne, if you have uh, any questions uh, further on that, just uh, give me a call back or call, uh, call myself, call Jason. Um, we work together. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll follow through on that. Uh, so I really appreciate your time here. Uh, there's, uh, the, the pace of change is far beyond anything I've uh, experienced in the last uh, few months. When you look at some of these changes in the CARES Act, CARES Act went back to 2017. Some of them went back to 2017. A um, lot of things going on. Uh, let's uh, working together. We can hopefully uh, clarify what's going on, help you get a sense of calmness in these very challenging times. And uh, as always, feel free to. Uh, Reach out to us, uh, and anyone at J.A. Cakes, when you're a client of J.A.K., you really are, you uh, really do have every, the resource of everybody here. On that, we're gonna, a rare thing, we're gonna finish a meeting early. Enjoy the extra 10 minutes to get to your day now, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks a lot.